This land is unlike any other. We have more square feet of awesomeness per person than any other nation on Earth. It's why we flock towards lakes. This is the Molson Canadian advertisement, originally aired during the 2010 Vancouver Olympic Winter Games. As one can see, alcohol culture is flourishing in Canada today. It can be surprising for some people to find out that Canada had the prohibition of alcohol less than a hundred years ago. Many factors led to alcohol prohibition in the early 20th century, and this era caused many business deals and social unrest to occur. Prohibition was an effort taken on by generations of Canadians that managed to take into effect during World War I. The first temperance societies in Canada were stationed in Pictou County, Nova Scotia, and Montreal, Quebec around 1827. Major temperance groups started showing up such as the Dominion Alliance for the Total Suppression of the Liquor Traffic and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The organization was also a strong supporter of women's suffrage. I solemnly promise God helping me to abstain from the use of all distilled, fermented, and malt liquor. And that means wine and beer. Eventually, temperance became so strong in Canada that the government passed the Duncan Act in 1864, which states that a county or municipality must prohibit alcohol sales should the majority vote that way. Then the Scott Act extended that bill to a federal level. Suddenly, on August 4th, 1914, Canada was plunged into war. The whole world was at war because of a conflict solely between Austria-Hungary and Serbia. Soldiers suffered awful conditions for years, if they survived that long. There were over eight and a half million deaths in the war to supposedly end all wars. On the home front, people had two main jobs. One, to keep other spirits up, and two, to produce more munition, food, and clothing as the demand increases. Job makers found many of their male employees leaving their job in order to fight in Europe. Therefore, they started to hire more and more women. Because of the increase in respect that they earned based on their help on the war effort, women were finally given suffrage in 1918, the year the First World War ended. By the War Measures Act, Prime Minister Borden was able to stop the production of liquor during the war. After the war, since women had the right to vote, prohibition stayed in effect. But why? You say laughter, and I say laughter. During this time, women were fed up with their husbands who often drank too much. Men's drinking sometimes resulted in domestic violence. The most influential movement during this time interested in temperance reform was the social gospel movement. The social gospel was a Protestant-based attempt from the 1890s to the 1930s that was known for supporting such modern concepts as Reform Darwinism. The movement gained popularity and gained many followers Protestant women in particular, who felt that alcohol was putting a strain on their husband's economic success. Then came along the 1920s, a time of economic prosperity, new inventions, and dancing. Lots and lots of dancing. Many people had to adjust to a life without alcohol. Despite the popularity that the social gospel gained, many people were still opposed to prohibition. Most French Canadians were Catholics and opposed prohibition, not wanting to conform to a Protestant agenda. They viewed prohibition as creating further tensions between English and French Canadians. Alcohol laws were different from province to province. Some allowed the sale of private alcohol, some didn't. Alcohol was still permitted to be used for artistic, scientific, and medical purposes, which is why many pandemics occurred oddly during Christmas time. Eventually, people were so frustrated with the increase of the enforcement of the alcohol related laws. I'll just step inside this police box and arrest myself. 
that the first province re-legalized alcohol as early as 1919, Quebec. Soon Quebec became known as the sinkhole of North America, call it what you will, but Quebec capitalized on this advantage by attracting many tourists, earning them a lot of money. After Prohibition was repealed in all provinces except PEI where it wasn't repealed until 1948, the country was out of the Roaring Twenties and into the Dirty Thirties after the stock market crash of 1929. Many people had no jobs, no shelter, and no money. Considering alcohol was then legal in Canada, and it would be illegal in the States until 1933, many decided to capitalize on this by illegally smuggling booze over the border, otherwise known as rum running. Rum runners would take booze to illegal drinking places called speakeasies or blind pigs. Although most booze was smuggled via schooner, some was taken by car, usually a Ford Model T. British Columbia was the perfect province to smuggle booze to Western American states, like Washington. Lots of booze was taken from BC to Seattle through Puget Sound. Puget Sound was perfect for run runners because the body of water had a lot of open space as well as many beaches that are useful for hiding from the US Coast Guard of 5,000 officers. The man who was known as the King of King County Bootleggers, Roy Olmsted, was actually an ex-cop before he became a bootlegger. He observed the mistakes that others made, and he made sure not to repeat them. But he wasn't in the money business. I'm in the empire business. Eventually, Olmsted's reign terminated when he was ratted out and arrested. After leaving prison, Olmsted converted to the Christian science faith and dedicated his life to educating people on the destruction of alcohol. Say my name. You're Ray Olmstead. You're goddamn right. <laughs>